Lecture 18 Sky Gods and Earth Goddesses In our last lecture, we took several hypothetical, partly, snapshots of the way God or the gods might have looked in the Neolithic period. And we traced some human conceptions of God up to the time of the agricultural revolution. This time we want to pick up the story from where we left off last time, looking at what happens when sky gods begin to challenge the power or authority of the goddess. Now, both as a result of the agricultural revolution and of those Indo-European and Semitic invasions we looked at in Lecture 16. This time we'll be looking at it from the point of view of God rather than the point of view of the goddess. We've already cited Mertzea Eliad several times in his contention that the supreme beings of most early peoples had connection with the sky. Um, this is from his book Patterns of Comparative Religion, and this is what he says on that issue. The sky of its very nature as a starry vault, an atmospheric region, has a wealth of mythological and religious significance. Height, being on high, infinite space, all of these are hierophanies of what is transcendent, what is supremely sacred. A hierophany is a physical manifestation of something which is sacred or holy. He goes on to say, Atmospheric and meteorological life appears to be an unending myth and the supreme beings of primitive races, as well as the great gods of the earliest civilizations of history, all display a connection, sometimes more, sometimes less organic, with the sky, the air, and meteorological happening. The sky gods, as Eliad goes on to point out, usually in most religions get replaced by other forces, by fertility spirits, say. Um, because the sky's transcendence, its passivity, its remoteness, it, it makes it difficult to, to contemplate on a day-to-day -day way. And so most of the time, sky gods give way to more imminent fertility spirits. Um, in, in some places, like India, for example, those original sky gods simply become philosophical or theological abstractions while more anthropomorphic gods, more concerned with everyday life, become the focus of myth and ritual and cult. Um, we remember in Greece, for example, Uranos was the first sky god, but then he pretty much disappears, leaving behind only an account of how everything started. Except for lying on Gaia, breeding children in her, and then being emasculated by his son Cronus, he has no myths, he has no images. He recedes into remoteness. Later, a new sky god, Zeus, will take his place as the active deity in the pantheon. And Zeus was never called a creator god. He was rather the wielder of the thunderbolt. He was associated with rain, with storms, and fertility rather than creation. As we noted in the last lecture, this is a common pattern. The original sky god gives over his importance to fertility gods, whose job is to fertilize the goddess to assure abundant crops and livestock. Still, Eliad, again, says the sky never entirely loses its significance. Even when cult and ritual focuses on more imminent gods, the sky god is still out there, still thought of as supreme in some way. Usually he's still thought of as a creator god, and in very dire circumstances people might still call upon him and ask him for help. And the very idea of a creator god in the sky can tease people out of thought with ideas of vastness and inaccessibility and remoteness. Many people must have had their first experience with the idea of transcendence by looking at the sky, the way we all did as children, lying on our backs looking up at the clouds as they drift by and watching and trying to imagine what words like eternity or infinite might mean. Most early peoples needed to worship a goddess and a male consort, fertility gods, since survival depended on that. But the human fascination with something beyond the physical was always available, um, and that, that impulse toward the transcendent didn't go away just because we had to focus on, on vegetation gods and goddesses in order to keep alive. It's not surprising, then, that one of the motifs of creation stories, and we looked at this back in, uh, in the first unit, um, is the separation of earth and sky. We encountered that motif once in Lecture 3 where we saw Shu separating his children, Geb the earth and Nut the sky from each other's embrace. 
In lecture six, we had much the same myth in the separation of Rangi, heaven, and Papa, the earth, in a myth from Maori of New Zealand. Um, the Greek myth of Uranos and Gaia, which we've looked at a number of times, is also in this category, as is the Chinese myth of Pan Ku, who we remember spends 18,000 years pushing the heaven and the earth apart. Most often, as we've mentioned, the separation is caused by children who want a space to grow and develop. One theme of this kind of creation story, back from Unit 1, is the theme of differentiation. The primal unity of the sky and earth makes them together virtually androgynous and essentially static. Uh, the separation of earth and sky allows differentiation and it's on differentiation that creation depends. Leeming and Page say that the separation of world parents achieves duality, provides the two sticks necessary for the friction that can cause fire. The same motif occurs in an Indian myth from the Minyong of Northeast India. In this myth, Milo, the sky, lies upon Sadi, the earth, in eternal embrace. The there are creatures called Wiyus, um, and that class of creatures includes both animals and humans, call a meeting. The strongest Wiyus is given charge of just beating up on Milo until he gets frustrated and moves away to the sky. It works. Um, and uh, the sky does move away, although his initial retreat at first causes great chaos and havoc on Earth, but eventually, with the separation, everything settles down and creation proceeds. The Diaguenos people of Southern California have a story about the, the, the great maker of, uh, of um, the world and his brother blowing the Earth and sky apart by rubbing tobacco together and then blowing on it. Each time they blow on the tobacco, the sky moves a little farther and farther away until they get it where they want it. There's a Zuni myth in which the uh, in Mother Earth herself pushes Father Sky away so that, as she says, the children can know one thing from another. There are a lot of myths like this, um, and it's a very common motif in, uh, in creation stories. Many African stories make a special point of focusing on this separation of sky and earth. Uh, Africa has so many languages and so many cultures and so many myths that any generalization you make about African mythology is risky. But David Ungungbele in the Encyclopedia of Religion takes that risk by suggesting that many Africans have myths in which the supreme being after the first order of creation retreats to heaven sometimes in response to human behavior or disobedience, sometimes for other reasons. There's a story from the uh, Mendi people in uh, Sierra Leone in West Africa. For them, the supreme being is, is named Nguiwo, who makes everything, including animals and people, because he's lonely, because he doesn't want to be by himself anymore. He keeps them all with him in a cave, but he gives them all kinds of rules to live by and tells them if they break any of these rules, he's going to have to throw them out of the cave. One of the rules is that they shouldn't eat his food. Well, one by one, the animals begin to break this rule, and each time one does, he has to throw it out of the cave. And finally, the man and woman are the last two left, and for them, he asks, tells them to leave too, but he says, anytime you want something, just ask me, and I'll, I'll provide it for you. They do until he gets annoyed with having to spend all of his time simply taking care of things they want. They're asking for things all the time. And when he gets annoyed, he simply moves away to the heavens he, where he can still watch what happens, but he's so remote that the only way he can be reached is through the, the uh, spirits of one's ancestors. Um, the Krachi people of Togo in the beginning say that the great creator lay closely on top of Mother Earth. The humans had no, who had no room to move annoyed him so much until he moved to the sky, where, again, he can now be admired, but not easily reached. There are various reasons for his annoyance in this story, and some of them are kind of amusing. Um, in one, an old woman every day makes fufu out of yams, and she keeps bumping into the sky with her pestle, because he's so close by. And then every time she makes a cooking fire, the smoke burns his eyes, and eventually he gets tired of this and he just moves away. In one version of the story, the sky is so close that humans use it to dry their hands on. When their hands get dirty, they use the sky as a towel, and that irritates him, and, and he moves away. There's another one in which an old woman um, each day cuts out a part of the sky and puts in her soup, and she's noted for her great soup. Anyway, he leaves in a huff again here, never to return. Um, the Barazzi people have a creator who initially lives on Earth with his wife. 
Um, one of their children is named Kamonu, and he's a troublemaker from the very outset. Um, Niambi, the creator god, eventually banishes him for a while. His specific error or fault um, was that he killed a, an antelope, which Niambi tells, Niambi tells him was um, his brother. After a while, Niambi allows Kamonu to return and gives him a garden to cultivate, but whenever the an any animal gets into the garden, Kamonu kills them, and, uh, and so eventually his father gets annoyed with him again. When a series of bad things happen to Kamonu, he goes to his father and says he wants some magic to make sure that he can make these bad things stop happening. His father by now is thoroughly disgusted with his son, and so he continues to move away trying to avoid contact with his son. He goes first to an island, then to a mountaintop, but each time Kamonu manages to figure out a way of finding his father. Meanwhile, humans are reproducing and filling up the earth. Eventually, Niambi simply retreats to the sky. Um, and when he goes there, it, it, we're told he climbs up on a spider's web and then puts the eyes of the spider out so the spider can't find its way back. He is presumably now remote and safe. Kamonu tries once more to get to him by building a tower from the earth all the way up to heaven, but it collapses under its own weight before um, he gets that far. And now, from that time on, the creator god is also in the sky where he can be admired but not reached. The separation of earth and sky as we went through it in unit one is in some ways a good thing. Um, it gave us room, it got us going, it made us productive, it provided the friction that we needed to make heat and light. But it's also ambiguous in its consequences. We've noted some of those ambiguities along the way. In another African story, when the sky still lives on top of the earth, humans didn't have to grow their own food. They simply would tear off of the pe a piece of the sky and eat it every day. When the sky retreats, this golden age is over and we have to work for our food from here on. And as we've noted in, in Unit 1, that separation means that now, once that separation occurs, we are all fragments of some primeval unity, and that means we're all destined for death, which is our only chance to reachieve that primal stasis out of which we all came. In one version of the story of Nguiwo of the Mendi people, Nguiwo sends from the sky two messengers, a dog and a toad, with different messages. The dog is supposed to tell people that they won't die, they'll live forever. The toad is supposed to tell them that they will die. What happens is the dog stops to eat scraps along the way and takes a long time to get there. The toad just keeps on going and gets there first, and according to story, that's why people die. The retreat of the sky god left the world to the, to the goddess and her consort, as we talked about in the last lectures. But by retreating, the sky god doesn't lose all of his power and mystery. He can still use the sun as his all-seeing eye, so he can be omniscient and supremely powerful, even in his remoteness from human life and concerns. Meanwhile, the earth becomes the precinct of the goddess and her consort, and they are worshipped by people whose most important concerns are fertility of the land and animals. These are all internal developments as we understand them, but whatever was going to happen along the lines of these internal developments didn't happen, because of those invasions in parts of Asia and much of Europe and the Middle East that we talked about in Lecture 16. We won't repeat all of that, um, but just to remind you that in the Iron Age, these invasions ended what was left of the god goddess's hegemony. Invaders, the invaders were nomads from the Syro-Arabian desert and the steppes of Russia, and they defeated and absorbed cultures that were many centuries old. The Indo-Europeans went to Greece and Anatolia and parts of Mesopotamia, as well as Persia and India. We, we call those invaders into India Aryans, but um, Aryans are simply a branch of the Indo-European language family. Sanskrit is an Indo-European language, so that it's, it, they're all part of that larger Indo-European uh, invasion. Semitic invaders took over Canaan and Mesopotamia. The invaders had technological advantages that made them unstoppable. They had iron weapons, they had the war chariot, they had domesticated the camel and the horse. And as we mentioned last time, they also brought with them sky gods, or weather gods, who were also fierce warriors. And they would use their warrior skills to defeat the power of those who had once been their mates, the goddesses. The myth that once again shows this most clearly is the Babylonian Enuma Elish, in which Marduk kills his great-great-great-grandmother Tiamat. She had been, remember, the creatrix. She had created the universe out of herself in a birthing process. 
Marduk creates it out of her body as something separate from himself in a way that it couldn't be for her. About this myth, um, Bering and Cashford say this, all of the myths of the Iron Age in which a sky or sun god or hero conquers a great serpent or dragon can be traced to this Babylonian epic in which humanity was created from the blood of a sacrifice god and no longer from the womb of a primordial goddess. Marduk, we remember, in the process of doing this becomes king of the gods and creation is something that he makes apart from himself. Marduk, therefore, is the first in a series of sky gods to defeat and destroy the mother goddess and then to take her place as the creator of life, including the creation of the first humans. In the older pattern, uh, we remember, the goddess would sacrifice her son, Demutsi or Osiris or Adonis or Attis, to guarantee fertility. Here the son sacrifices his mother and the mother herself becomes a death-dealing dragon. She becomes a monster who has to be destroyed for creation to occur. In a metaphoric way, as we've said, the son becomes the father and the mother becomes the child in this total inversion of process. The same story gets told in India where uh, there, there's a war, warrior sky god named Indra who has his fight with a dragon, Vritra, and with the dragon's mother. Vritra is like um, Tiamat, a water monster, although he's male uh, rather than female. What he does though is he swallows up all the water of the earth or in other versions he gathers all the storm clouds, the great herds of storm clouds together and locks them up so that they are imprisoned and they can't release their rain. Indra, like Marduk, takes on this monster uh, in Indra's, in the Indian version, Indra fortifies himself with barrels, with gallons and gallons of something called soma, which is a kind of hallucinogenic drink that was used in sacrifices. And then he takes the thunderbolt, which he had taken away from his father when he killed his father, and this should sound familiar by now, um, and then has a fierce battle with Vritra, um, in which he is aided by the hymns of priests and the sacrifices of humans. He kills the dragon, and then he kills the dragon's mother. Once this happens, the, the cloud cattle are released and it begins to rain. Um, it's possible that this uh, ceremony, this ritual, was reenacted every autumn in, in time for the rainy season to encourage the rains to come to release those cloud cattle one more time. But the point is here that like Marduk, um, Indra becomes the lord of the thunderbolt, a rain god, a god of fertility. Once he is, he is established, like Marduk, he creates or recreates the universe. He measures out space with the sun. He builds a universe like a house, setting up the four corner posts of heaven and then thatching its roof with the sky. He sets the sun on its course and he creates the seasons, the months, day and night, and time. In a comparable um, Indian story, um, the, the great god Shiva conquers the river god, goddess Ganga and once he's conquered her and he tames her into the Ganges, a useful and obedient river. Myths like these come from all over the world in which sky gods defeat some remnant of the goddess who's then usually turned into a monster of some sort. The chimera is killed by Bellerophon. The gorgon Medusa is beheaded by Perseus. Zeus kills Tephaon, a monster with 100 serpent heads who is the son of Gaia herself and Apollo becomes the Delphic Oracle by killing the dragon of Earth. There are even memories of this kind of struggle between uh, a creator god and some kind of monster um, in the Old Testament. Even though those memories were suppressed in the two creation accounts that we looked at in Lecture 5, there are references all over the Old Testament to a kind of Yahweh Tiamat kind of fight which stands behind so much of creation. Psalm 74, for example, says, Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of the Leviathan in pieces and gavest him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Isaiah 27 says, In that day the Lord with his sore and great strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. So even the Old Testament remembers uh, back there somewhere, there's a, this kind of battle between uh, the creator god and some monster. 
So it, one of the ways that you can deal with the goddess is simply to turn her into a monster, a, a dragon, a, a leviathan, something who has to then be destroyed. Other myths handle this, the, the, the goddess problem in a different way by turning the goddess into a femme fatale, into a temptress who lures men out of the sunlight of reason into her mysterious darkness. Pandora is an example of this. Eve is an example of this. Ishtar with Gilgamesh, whom we'll get to in our next unit, um, is another example. Those two <laughs> ways of dealing with the goddess, one turning her into a monster, one making her into a femme fatale, are kind of merged in a story that's told by many Native Americans. Uh, usually it goes under the title of something like the Vagina Girls. This version is from the Ponca people who are part of the Sioux, in which a culture hero, Coyote, defeats these very dangerous women. Um, the story goes that uh, there is an, a woman who has two beautiful daughters, so beautiful in fact that many men would like to sleep with them or marry them. Um, the coyote hears about this. The trouble is that what happens is every time a man disappears into the house of these, these beautiful young women, he disappears. He's never seen again. Uh, so they've acquired a kind of a reputation for danger. But coyote thinks, how can sleeping with two pretty women be that dangerous? And they are beautiful. So he goes to their house. He's fed, and then he's bedded down between the two of them. Just before they go to sleep, one of them whispers in his ear that uh, that she is the, the the old woman in the house is a witch. The other one is her daughter. This one, she says, I am being kept as a prisoner. Both of them, the witch has given teeth in places where there shouldn't be teeth, uh, teeth in their vagina, so that every time a man tries to enter one of these women, he gets chewed into kindling, um, and and killed. Um, so when knowing this, in fact. Um, Coyote thinks he can actually hear teeth gnashing in the places where he was told they would be. So when the witch's daughter invites him that night to make love to her, um, instead of entering her himself, he uses a piece of kindling from the fire, which is immediately chewed into uh, little splinters. Um, then what he takes, uses one of his arrows and uses that. Before the teeth can snap shut, he reaches all the way to her heart and he kills the young woman. Um, he also kills the old woman, and then he takes the third woman, the young woman who is being held as a prisoner, he takes her with him and eventually marries her. Not, however, before removing those dangerous teeth, all except, as the uh, myth has it, they left one blunt one in place, which makes lovemaking even better than it would have been without it. In both kinds of these myths, um, whether you're making a female into a monster or making her into a femme fatale, the values of the goddess, which were mystery and darkness and connection with the lunar cycle, with the birthing process, maybe even with intuition and emotion, are devalued in the face of reason and clarity and order, which are now all represented by sky gods. Even nurturing loses some of its value in these new virtues, the new necessary virtues of heroic struggle and warfare and conquest. Spirit becomes associated with the sky god, matter with the goddess, a valuation that, as we said, has haunted human understanding of gender ever since. The new values of the city dwellers devalued the older values of a purely agricultural people and elevate new ones. The warrior becomes more important than the farmer, and the deities attached to these new roles gain importance. One of the really profound consequences of this change in history is mentioned by Joseph Campbell in his Occidental Mythology, where he points out that for the first time in history, politics becomes important enough to have its own deity, its own mythology. He says it this way, We have now not only a new social order, but a new psychology, a new structure of human thought and feeling overinterpreted as of cosmic reach. We have now entered a theater of myth that the rational, non-mystic mind can comprehend without aid where the art of politics, the art of gaining power over men, received for all time its celestial model. Politics becomes protected by mythology now. Um, Leeming and Page say that the sky god gains his ascendancy over the um, uh, goddess in two different ways. First. There's a shift in emphasis away from the partner who gives birth to the one who fertilizes or fecundates her. Rain impregnates Mother Earth and becomes the real vitalizing force. Almost all of these new sky gods are gods of rain. He's also sometimes pictured as a bull or a ram of heaven who impregnates at will Mother Earth. 
how important male participation in, in creation becomes, we've already seen in several myths that we've looked at. Uranus emasculated by Cronus as it has his genitals thrown into the sea, and they all by themselves create Aphrodite. In the Japanese myth of Izanagi in Lecture 16, after he's divorced his wife and takes his ritual bath, by himself he creates a whole new generation of gods and goddesses, including Amaterasu. Zeus produces Athena from his head and Dionysus from his thigh, all by himself, even though we have to admit females were at least involved in the initial, initial conceptions of those figures. Uh, in uh, a Chukchi Inuit myth from northeastern Siberia, Raven gets very jealous when his wife on her own creates a pair of twins. To get even, he tries to create something too, something all, all by himself of his own. From his own defecation and urine, he creates the earth, and then he creates men from seeds, which he does on his own. It's still in this myth, he needs a spider woman to help him come and create women, but his competition with his wife is real. He wants to be a maker too. Leeming and Page says this may be one of the earliest cases in history of what they call vulva envy. Um, the ultimate illustration, of course, of this, I think, is that myth of Atum that we looked at in Lecture 3, in which Atum either masturbates or expectorates the first generation of gods into existence. In India, Indra, once he becomes king of the god, becomes the ultimate fecundator, bringing rain, making seeds active, fertilizing the world, even giving po women power to procreate himself. He becomes the world bull and he carries the thunderbolt and now he possesses all of this power. The second way in which sky gods can trump the goddess is by providing order and coherence and clarity in the new political and social circumstances that emerge after cities. Magic and mystery had been part of the age of the goddess, but the new kings presided over complex societies that were full of new occupations like mining and architecture and tool making and weapon making and writing and mathematics and warfare and governing. The new values here were the light of reason and the ability to predict the future. Fewer and fewer people now were needed for agriculture and more and more were used for other tasks. And as that happened, the power of the fertility goddess waned and a new pantheon grew up around a new kind of life. The new god, the new high god, turns out almost always to be a god of storms, the god of rain, the god of sun, and the god of war. And his representatives turn out to be the king, the priest, the judge, and the warrior. Eliad says that uh, the sun becomes the most important deity in most advanced cultures, so that the connection between the sun as the cosmic lord and the king as the earthly lord would have been an obvious one. The sky god could still see all and know all, which are useful attributes for the protector of kings and warriors and governors. This is probably what Campbell meant when he said that the art of politics, the art of gaining power over men, received for all time its celestial model. A summary once again of this period, this, this piece, this snapshot of where the God has reached. This also from Leeming and Page. God was now prepared to consolidate all deities within himself and to emerge fully as sole Lord and creator of the universe, the ultimate Father God. In so doing, he would complete his usurpation of the role of the great mother of pre-Aryan times. Like her, he would become the source and essence of all being. This, in a way, um, anticipates um, our next lecture, because in the next lecture, we're going to take a look at what God, how God looks when he becomes the sole creator of the universe. We're not quite there yet, but we're, as you can see, we're on our way. Also, the, the other thing that happens is once when the, the sky god, a sky god, becomes supreme as the creator god, one of the problems with a god who's that remote, as we've seen in all those African myths we looked at, is that he's very, very remote. He's a long, long ways away. It's hard to understand how to reach him, how to, how to manage to, to make contact with him. As in many of those African stories, as we saw, the only way you can contact God is through the spirits of your ancestors. Well, the remoteness can be a problem in its own right. And so one of the things that we'll take, one of the other things we'll take a look at in our next lecture is we'll look at some of the ways humans down through history in mythical ways have tried to get closer to that remote God, tried to make that gap between there and here, make the remoteness a little less remote. And one of the ways of doing that is finding the God not out there somewhere, but also finding the God in here, finding the God within us. And we'll take a look at some of those solutions also in our next lecture.